Ladies and gentlemen, after in the first lecture, we have circumscribed the concept of theology. And after in the second lecture, we have begun to describe the place of theology by relating it to be the crystal clear and unambiguous word of God. Our topic today is the witnesses. For a closer determination of the place of evangelical theology, we must take note of a definite, although not statistically definable, group of men. These men enjoy a special and singular, a unique position in their relation to the words of God. But their position is not special by virtue of a particular attitude of their sentiments or attitude towards the world or by the fact that it might earn particular favors, honors, or halos for them. Instead, it is spatial by virtue of their particular historical situation in which they are confronted by this word, by the particular service to which the word called and equipped them. They are the witnesses of the world. To be more precise, they are its primary witnesses because they are called directly by the world to be its heroes and they are appointed for its communication and verification to other men. These men of whom we speak are the biblical witnesses of the world, the prophetic men of the Old Testament and the apostolic men of the New. They were contemporaries of the history in which God established his covenant with men. In fact, they were contemporary witnesses by what they saw and heard of this history in which God spoke his word to men. Other men, of course, were also contemporary witnesses of this history. But the prophets and apostles became and existed as eyewitnesses of his deeds done in their time and as hearers of his word spoken in it. They were destined, elected, and selected for this cause by God to act and speak, not by themselves, by him they were also commanded and empowered to speak of what they had seen and heard. They speak as men who in this qualified sense were there. The logos of God in their witness is the concrete concern of evangelical theology. 
Though this theology has no direct information about the logo, it nevertheless has this indirect information with the utmost certainty. The prophetic men of the Old Testament saw Yahweh's action in the history of Israel. His action as father, king, lawgiver, and judge. They saw his free and constructive love, which nevertheless was a consuming love. In Israel's election and calling, they saw Yahweh's grace and in his kind but also severe and wrathful direction and rule over his people, they saw his untiring protest and opposition to the conduct of Israel's incorrigible contender with God. Israel's history spoke to them. In the manifold forms of this history, they heard Yahweh's commands, judgments, and threats, as well as his promises. Not confirmation of their own religious, moral, or political, optimistic or pessimistic views, opinions, and postulations. What they heard was instead the solemn voice of the God of the covenant. Thus says the Lord, this is the God who is constantly faithful to his unfaithful human partner. It was his own word which these witnesses were enabled, permitted, and called to echo either as prophets in the narrower sense of the term, or as prophetic narrators, or occasionally as lawyers, or as prophetic poets and teachers of wisdom. In giving their witness, they, of course, listed it to their predecessors as well, appropriating in one way or another their answers and incorporating them into their own answers. It was Yahweh's word itself, as it was spoken in his history with Israel, which they brought to the hearing of their people. Naturally, each prophet also spoke within the limits and horizon of his time, its problems, culture, and language. They spoke first of all, viva voce, but they also wrote down these words, or had them written down so that they should be remembered by following generations. The Old Testament canon is the later collection of the writings of this kind which prevailed and won acknowledgement for themselves in the synagogue. In virtue of their content, they were recognized as authentic, trustworthy, and authoritative testimony to the word of God. Evangelical theology hears their witness with the greatest earnestness, not merely 
as a sort of prelude to the New Testament. The classic rule is Novum Testamentum in Vetere Latte, Vetus in Novo Patet. The New Testament is concealed within the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed within the New. As long as theology preferred to neglect this rule, as long as it wished to exist in a vacuum by claiming to be oriented exclusively to the New Testament, it was continually threatened by Cancer, cancer bonds. Nevertheless, <coughs> theology must obviously focus its attention on the goal of the history of Israel, on the prophetic word spoken in this history, on the history of Jesus Christ as it is witnessed to by the apostolic men of the New Testament. What these men saw and heard, what their hands touched, was the fulfillment of the covenant in the existence and appearance of the one human partner who was obedient to God. This fulfillment was the Lord who, as a servant, lived, suffered, and died in the place of the disobedient, the Lord who uncovered, but also covered, their folly, taking upon himself and taking away their guilt, uniting them and reconciling them with their divine partner. In the death of this Lord, they saw the old contender against God overcome and done in. In the life of this Lord, another man came forward, the new contender for God. In him they saw the hallowing of God's name, the coming of his kingdom, the fulfilling of his will on earth. In this event, in time, and space in the flesh they were allowed to hear the word of God in its glory as a pledge, promise, warning and consolation to all men. By Jesus' commission the apostles were sent out into the world in a test, to attest to all men that he, Jesus, is this word of God. Once again, the subject and strength of their commission were neither their impressions of Jesus, their estimation of his person and his work, nor their faith in him. Instead, their theme was God's mighty work 
spoke in Jesus' resurrection from the dead, which gave his life and death power and control over all creatures of all times. The apostles spoke, told, wrote and preached about Jesus as men who were in this way directly humiliated and instructed. They spoke as many who had behind them the empty tomb and before them the living Jesus. <coughs> Let it be noted that apart from Jesus' history as God's reconciling act and mighty word revealing this fact, the apostles lacked all interest in any other aspect of his history. They ignored any reality that might have preceded this history of salvation and revelation. There simply was no such reality. Therefore, they could not know or be concerned with any such hypothetical reality. Jesus' history was real, and real to them, exclusively as a history of salvation and revelation. For them, Jesus' reality was exclusively linked to their proclamation and based on his self-proclamation as Kyrios, son of God and son of man. It was neither a so-called historical Jesus, nor a so-called Christ of faith, which they knew and proclaimed. Neither the abstract image of one in whom they did not yet believe, nor the equally abstract image of one in whom they afterwards believed. Instead, they proclaimed concretely the one Jesus Christ who had encountered them as the one who he was even when they did not yet believe in him as the one who at that very time made himself known to them. A twofold Jesus Christ, one who existed before and another who existed after Easter can only be deduced from the New Testament texts when he has been previously read into them and just in the eyes of historical criticism this separation this operation ought to be profoundly suspect. The origin, object, and content of the New Testament witness, where and are the one history of salvation and revelation in which Jesus Christ is both God's deed and God's work. Before and behind this history, 
all such subdued testament witnesses could reflect and gaze upon was its commencement in the history of Israel as witnessed in the Old Testament. To this preceding history and to this alone they were constantly oriented. The New Testament canon is a collection of testimonies fixed in writing and handed down which relate the history of Jesus Christ in a way which proved itself authentic to the community of the second, third, and fourth century. In contrast to all kinds of similar literature, they approved themselves as the original and faithful documents of what the witnesses of the resurrection saw, heard, and proclaimed. It was these early communities which first acknowledged this collection as genuine and authoritative testimony to the one word of God at the same time adopting the Old Testament canon from the synagogue with a remarkable naturalness as so this were a matter of course. We shall now attempt to clarify with a few pointers how evangelical theology is related to this biblical testimony to the word of God. First of all, theology shares with the biblical prophecy and apostolate a common concern for human response to the divine word. The witnesses of the Old and New Testament were men, like all others, men who had heard the word and listened to it in a human way, in speech, vision, and thoughts that were human and conditioned by time and space. They were theologians. And also they had an identical orientation to an identical object. As theologians, they differed widely from one another. Anything other than their intention, anything more or less than that, cannot be the intention of evangelical theology in its study of those writings, what uh, theology has to learn as much as anything else is the method of a human thought and speech that are oriented to the word of God. Also same in the second place, Theology is neither a prophecy nor apostolate. Its relationship to God's word cannot be compared to the position of the biblical witness because it can only know the word of God at second hand, only in the mirror and echo of the biblical witness. The place of theology is not somewhere on the same or similar level with the position of those first witnesses. The human reply to the word 
will in practice always consist partially in a basic question, and theology cannot and dare not presume that its human response stands in some immediate relationship to the word spoken by God himself at the place where everything depended on being present, theology was once for all not present. Still less in the third place can the position of theology be I abode that of the biblical witnesses. The theologian can no doubt possess a better, a better uh, astronomy, geography, zoology, psychology, physiology, and so on, than those witnesses possess. Why not? But as for the word of God, he should not conduct himself in relationship to those witnesses as so he know, knew more about the word than say no. He is no president of the seminary. He is no mere spectabilis who would have authority over the prophets and apostles. He cannot grant and refuse them a hearing at all, say, where colleagues on the faculty. Still less is he a high school teacher who would be authorized and commissioned to look over their shoulder benevolently or crossly to correct their notebooks or to give them good average or bad marks. <laughs> Even the smallest, strangest, simplest or obscurest among the prophets and the apostles of the Bible has an incomparable advantage over even the most pious, scholarly, and sagacious late theologian. From his spatial point of view and in his special fashion, he has thought, spoken, and written about the same object in direct confrontation with it. All the subsequent theology, as well as the whole subsequent community called the Church, will never find itself placed in that immediate confrontation. Once and for all, in the fourth place, theology has its position beneath the biblical scriptures. It knows and considers that the writings with which it is concerned are holy writings. For all their human and conditioned character, as such, these writings are selected and separated, and they deserve and demand respect and attention of extraordinary kind, since they have a direct relationship to God's work and word. In the school of the prophetic and apostolic men, theology must learn from them, from them alone and always 
it must learn not this or that important truth or weighty matter, but the one thing that is necessary with respect to this one thing on which everything depends, they are better informed than theologians are. And for this reason, theology must agree to let them look over its shoulder and correct its notebooks. The one thing on which everything depends in the fifth place is acquaintance with the God of the Gospel. This acquaintance is never to be taken for granted, never already on hand, never brought along beforehand by any theologian in any intellectual or spiritual briefcase or pillbox. The knowledge of Immanuel, the God of man and for man, includes acquaintance with the man of God. This is his marvelous distinction from the gods of all other theology. Theology has Immanuel, true God, true man, as its object. When it comes from the Holy Scriptures and all this, the new returns to that. It is they that bear witness to me. Theology only becomes possible and actual as evangelical theology when the God of the Gospel encounters it also in the mirror and echo of the prophetic and apostolic word, it must also grasp God's work and word as a theme and problem of its own thinking and speaking in the same way that the Yahwist and Elohist, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Matthew, Paul and John, saw and heard this word. Many other things, much that is interesting, beautiful, good and true, could also be communicated and is close to theology by all sorts of old and new literature of other kinds. But with respect to the theme and problems that make it theological science, it will for better or for worse have to stick to this literature, the Holy Scriptures. Nevertheless, in the sixth place, theology confronts in the Holy Scriptures an extremely polyphonic, not a monotonous testimony to the work and word of God. Everything that can be heard, there is differentiated not only the voices of the Old and New Testaments as such, but also the many voices that result within the two Testaments. It should be noted that the primary and real basis of this differentiation does not lie 
in the various psychological, sociological, and cultural conditions which differ for each witness. There is, of course, such a preliminary basis in the profusion of the biblical witnesses, in the various factors influencing their purposes and points of view, in the variety of their languages and the special theology of each one. But the primary basis for this differentiation lies in the objective multiplicity and inner contrasts of the motion of the history of the covenant which they recount and affirm. This motion is all-inclusive. It embraces even its smallest particles, reflecting the interplay of unity and disunity between God and man, as made known by these witnesses. Also, theology is certainly confronted with the one God in the school of these witnesses. This God is one in the fullness of this life, existence, action, and revelation. In this school, theology can in no way become monolithic, monomanic, monotonous and infallibly boring. <laughs> In no way can it find or limit itself to one spatial subject or another. In this school, theology will be oriented to the unceasing succession of different Loci of the divine work and work, and in this way, theological understanding, thought, and speech will receive their definite place. In the school of these witnesses, theology inevitably begins to wander. So, always with the same goal. It migrates from the Old Testament to the New, and back again from the Yahwists to the Priestly Codex, from the Psalms of David to the Proverbs of Solomon, from the Gospel of John to the Synoptic Gospels, from the letter to the Galatians, to the so-called straw epistle of James, <laughs> and so on continually. Within all of these writings, the pilgrimage leads from one level of tradition to another, taking into account every stage of tradition that may be present or surmised with more or less reason. In this respect, the work of theology might be compared to the task of circling a high mountain which also, it is one and the same mountain exists and manifests itself in very different shapes. <coughs> the eternally rich God is the content of the knowledge of evangelical theology. His one mystery 
is known only in the overflowing fullness of his counsels, ways, and judgments. Theology responds to the logos of God in the seventh place when it endeavors to hear and speak of him always anew on the basis of his biblical testimony. Its searching of the scriptures consists in asking the text whether and to what extent they might witness to him, whether and to what extent they in their complete humanity reflect and equal the word of God is not known anywhere at all beforehand. This possibility must be seen and heard again and again, and this knowledge must be run and brought to light repeatedly. The open, candid question about this work is what theology brings to the Bible. All other questions are only coordinated and subordinated to this question. They can only present technical aids to its solution. Nowadays, of course, the exegetical theological task is often said to consist in the translation of the biblical assertions out of the speech of a past time into the language of modern men. The remarkable assumption behind this project, however, seems to be that the content, meaning and point of the biblical assertions are relatively easy to ascertain and may afterwards be presupposed as self-evident. The main task would then be simply to render these assertions understandable and relevant to the modern world by means of some sort of linguistic key. The main problem of theology would then be was deep thinking German, German theologian called today the problem of the Sprachlichkeit. The message is all very well is then said, but how do you tell it to the man on the street? <laughs> the truth of the matter, however, is that the central affirmation of the Bible are not self-evident. The word of God itself as witnessed to in the Bible is not immediately obvious in any particular chapter or verse of any one of these writings taken in itself. On the contrary, this truth must be sought just in order to be understood in its deep simplicity. Every possible means must be used, philological and historical criticism and analysis, careful consideration of the nearer and the more remote textual relationships, and not least, the enlistment of all the conjectural imagination that, as is to be hoped, is also available. 
The question about this word and these questions alone corresponds and does justice to the intention of the biblical authors and their texts. And by the way, might not this question also do justice to modern man? If modern man is earnestly interested in the Bible, he certainly does not ask for prophets for its translation into its into his momentary jargon. Instead, he himself would like to participate in the effort to draw near to what stands there. This effort is what theology owes to the modern man and above all to the Bible itself. What stands there in the text of this book is the witness to the word of God. The word of God is this testimony of the Bible. Just how far it stands there, however, is a fact that demands us ceasing discovery, interpretation and recognition. It demands investigation, something that cannot be achieved without blood, sweat and tears. The biblical witness and the Holy Scripture encounter theology as the object of this investigation. The topic of tomorrow will be the place of theology within the community called the Church. We shall now attempt to clarify with a few pointers how evangelical theology is related to this biblical testimony to the word of God. First of all, theology shares with the biblical prophecy and apostolate a common concern for human response to the divine word. The witnesses of the Old and New Testament were men like all authors, men who had heard the word and listened to it in a human way, in speech, vision, and thought that were human and conditioned by time and space. They were theologians. And also they had an identical orientation to an identical object. As theologians, they differed widely from one another. Anything other than their intention, anything more or less than that, cannot be the intention of evangelical theology in its study of those writings, what uh, theology has to learn as much as anything else is the method of a human thought and speech that are oriented to the word of God. Also said in the second place, Theology is neither prophecy nor apostolate. Its relationship to God's word cannot be compared 
to the position of the biblical witnesses because it can only know the word of God at second hand, only in the mirror and echo of the biblical witness. The place of theology is not somewhere on the same or similar level with the position of those first witnesses. The human reply to the word will in practice always consist partially in a basic question and theology cannot and dare not presume that its human response stands in some immediate relationship to the word spoken by God himself at the place where everything depended on being present, theology was once for all not present. Still less in the third place can the position of theology be by a bold stat of the biblical witnesses. The theologian can no doubt possess a better, a better uh, astronomy, geography, zoology, psychology, physiology, and so on than those witnesses possessed. Why not? But as for the word of God, he should not conduct himself in relationship to those witnesses as so he know you more about the word than say no. He is no president of the seminary. <laughs> he is no vir spectabilis who would have authority over the prophets and apostles. He cannot grant and refuse them a hearing at all they were colleagues on the faculty. Still less is he a high school teacher who would be authorized and commissioned to look over their shoulder benevolently or crossly to correct their notebooks or to give them good average or bad marks. <laughs> Even the smallest, strangest, simplest, or obscurest among the prophets and the apostles of the Bible has an incomparable advantage over even the most pious, scholarly, and sagacious later theology. From his spatial point of view and in his spatial fashion, he has thought, spoken, and written about the same object in direct confrontation with it. All subsequent theology, as well as the whole subsequent community called the Church, will never find itself placed in that immediate confrontation. Once and for all, in the first place, theology has its position beneath the biblical scriptures. It knows and considers that the writings with which it is concerned are holy writings, 
for all their human and conditioned character. As such, these writings are selected and separated, and they deserve and demand respect and attention of extraordinary kind, since they have a direct relationship to God's work and word. In the school of the prophetic and apostolic men, theology must learn from them, from them alone and always afresh. It must learn, not this or that important truth or weighty matter, but the one thing that is necessary with respect to this one thing on which everything depends, they are better informed than theologians are. And for this reason, theology must agree to let them look over its shoulder and correct its notebooks. The one thing on which everything depends in the fifth place is acquaintance with the God of the Gospel. This acquaintance is never to be taken for granted, never already on hand never brought along beforehand by any theologian in any intellectual or spiritual briefcase or pillbox. The knowledge of Emmanuel, the God of man and for man, includes acquaintance with the man of God. This is his marvelous distinction from the gods of all other theologies. Theology has Immanuel, true God, true man, as its object. When it comes from the Holy Scriptures and always the new returns to that. It is they that bear witness to me. Theology only becomes possible and actual as evangelical theology when the God of the Gospel encounters it also in the mirror and echo of the prophetic and apostolic word, it must, must also grasp God's work and word as the theme and problem of its own thinking and speaking in the same way that the Yahwist and Elohist, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Matthew, Paul and John saw and heard this word. Many other things, much that is interesting, beautiful, good and true, could also be communicated and disclosed to theology by all sorts of old and new literature of other kinds. But with respect to the theme and problem that make it theological science, it will, for better or for worse, have to stick to this literature, the Holy Scriptures. Nevertheless, in the sixth place, theology confronts in the Holy Scriptures an extremely polyphonic, not a monotonous testimony to the work 
and word of God. Everything that can be heard, there is differentiated, not only the voices of the Old and New Testaments as such, but also the many voices that result within the two Testaments. It should be noted that the primary and real basis of this differentiation does not lie in the various sociological, sociological and cultural conditions which differ for each witness. There is, of course, such a preliminary basis in the profusion of the biblical witnesses, and the various factors influencing their purposes and points of view, in the variety of their languages and the special theology of each one. But the primary basis for this differentiation lies in the objective multiplicity and inner contrasts of the motion of the history of the covenant which they recount and affirm. This motion is all inclusive. It embraces even its smallest particles, reflecting the interplay of unity and disunity between God and man, as made known by these witnesses. Also, theology is certainly confronted with the one God in the school of these witnesses. This God is one in the fullness of his life, existence, action, and revelation. In this school, theology can in no way become monolithic, monomanic, monotonous, and infallibly boring. <laughs> In no way can it find or limit itself to one spatial subject or another. In this school, theology will be oriented to the unceasing succession of different loci of the divine work and work, and in this way theological understanding, thought and speech will receive their definite place. In the school of these witnesses, theology inevitably begins to wander. So always with the same goal in mind, it migrates from the Old Testament to the New, and back again from the Yahwists to the Priestly Codex, from the Psalms of David to the Proverbs of Solomon, from the Gospel of John to the Synoptic Gospels, from the Letter to the Galatians, to the so-called straw epistle of James, <laughs> and so on continually. Within all of these writings, the pilgrimage leads from one level of tradition to another, taking into account every stage of tradition that may be present or surmised with more or less reason. 
In this respect, the work of theology might be compared to the task of circling a high mountain, which, although it is one and the same mountain, exists and manifests itself in very different shapes. <coughs> The eternally rich God is the content of the knowledge of evangelical theology. His one mystery <coughs> is known <coughs> only in the overflowing fullness of his counsels, ways, and judgments. <coughs> theology responds to the logos of God in the seventh place, when it endeavors to hear and speak of him always anew on the basis of his biblical testimony. Its searching of the scriptures consists in asking the text whether and to what extent they might witness to him, whether and to what extent they, in their complete humanity, reflect and equal the word of God, is not known anywhere at all beforehand. This possibility must be seen and heard again and again. And this knowledge must be won and brought to light repeatedly. The open, candid question about this work is what theology brings to the Bible. All other questions are only coordinated and subordinated to this question. They can only present technical aids to its solution. Nowadays, of course, the exegetical theological task is often said to consist in the translation of the biblical assertions out of the speech of a past time into the language of modern men. The remarkable assumption behind this project, however, seems to be such the content, meaning and point of the biblical assertions are relatively easy to ascertain and may afterwards be presupposed as self-evident. The main task would then be simply to render these assertions understandable and relevant to the modern world by means of some sort of linguistic key. The main problem of theology would then be was deep thinking German, German theologian called today the problem of the Sprachlichkeit. The message is all very well, is then said, but how do you tell it to the man on the street? <laughs> the truth of the matter, however, is that the central affirmation of the Bible are not self-evident. The word of God itself as witness to in the Bible is not immediately obvious in any particular chapter or verse of any one of these writings taken in itself. On the contrary, this truth must be sought just in order to be understood 
in its deep simplicity. Any possible means must be used, philological and historical criticism and analysis, careful consideration of the nearer and the more remote textual relationships, and not least, the enlistment of all the conjectural imagination that, as is to be hoped, is also available. The question about this word and these questions alone corresponds and does justice to the intention of the biblical authors and their texts. And by the way, might not this question also do justice to modern man, if modern man is earnestly interested in the Bible, he certainly does not ask for projects for its translation into its into his momentary jargon. Instead, he himself would like to participate in the effort to draw near to what stands there. This effort is what theology owes to the modern man, and above all to the Bible itself. What stands there in the text of this book is the witness to the word of God. The word of God is this testimony of the Bible. Just how far it stands there, however, is a fact that demands us ceasing discovery, interpretation, and recognition. It demands investigation, something that cannot be achieved without blood, sweat, and tears. The biblical witness and the Holy Scripture encounter theology as the object of this investigation. The topic of tomorrow will be the place of theology within the community called the Church. <laughs>